All right, we are going to talk about pelvic fractures and to discuss pe pelvic fractures, we need pelvises. So these are our pelvises. So let's take a, a quick tour of the pelvis themselves. So we have a superior pubic rami and an inferior pubic rami here. Our pubic symphysis is here. Our, all our wings are gonna be coming up around this side. And our iliosacral ligaments, which are some of the strongest ligaments on the body, are here, and then our sacrum's coming around there. So um, both of our, uh, our pelvises here are similar, and we're gonna show how pelvises fracture in a couple different ways here. So as you can see, there's lots of meat and juicy stuff within the pelvis that we want to protect. So we are gonna start talking about anterior posterior compression. So now the load is being placed on the pelvis and you can start to see some of the strain within the skeletal structure. So at this point you can start to see some changes in the pubic symphysis. Now as long as the symphysis hasn't widened more than 2.5 centimeters and there's no evidence of trauma to the posterior pelvic ring, this is an injury that is typically managed conservatively. Now, as soon as the symphysis is widening more than 2.5 centimeters, there's gonna be other ligaments that are injured in the process. This will start as disruption of the anterior sacral iliac ligaments, and then as the pelvis is injured more, the posterior sacral iliac ligaments will blow out as well. So we frequently hear about the dreaded open book pelvic fracture. This occurs when there's internal rotation instability at the pubic symphysis from disruption at that site. And then as you tear the internal sacral iliac ligaments, you allow the rest of the pelvis to rotate externally. And at that point, the pelvis is able to open just like a book. And as you can see, from the damage to the fruit of the watermelon, the meat of a human is going to take a lot of energy in these kind of injuries. And you have to be particularly careful about vascular injuries in these patients. So now we're going to move on to pumpkins. So you may ask yourself what happened to the other watermelon and why are we moving on to a pumpkin? Well, it turns out that fruit doesn't always break like the human body. And so when we tried to break the pumpkin, or we tried to break the watermelon with lateral compression, it broke like it should have with anterior posterior compression and that doesn't work at all. So with lateral compression, we have the same anatomy of the pelvis as we should, but this time the fracture patterns are going to be different and they're gonna start with a focus at the pubic rami. So you can see as the pelvis is starting to torque and twist that the rami are gonna take a big load of this and they're gonna snap. At the same time, the sacrum's gonna take a lot of stress with this and the wing or the alar of the sacrum is gonna compress and you can get a compression fracture of the sacrum. Now with this LC1 type fracture, as long as the sacral fracture is not complete, these patients are going to be managed conservatively as well. The thing to be careful about with the LC1 fractures is that there's an 8% associated mortality, not because of the pelvic instability itself, but because if there's enough energy to snap the pelvis like this, there's likely other associated life-threatening injuries as well. Now to take a look at the more serious lateral compression fractures, we're gonna look at the posterior side of the pelvis as we're applying lateral compression. From here, there are a couple ways that the lateral compression fracture can propagate. The LC2 type is where you have the anterior pubic rami fracture, and then you get an ipsilateral on the same side, posterior ilium fracture as well. Once you have that posterior ilium fracture, it requires surgical treatment. And then the LC3 type of pelvic fracture occurs when you have a lateral compression fracture on one side of the pelvis, and then an AP compression fracture pattern on the other side of the pelvis. This is commonly referred to as a windswept pelvis, and this injury is also associated with massive vascular trauma. And finally, 
No discussion about pelvic fractures could be complete without discussing vertical shear fractures. So in this example, our pelvis is now a potato. And you can see as the potato pelvis comes down and there is a force applied to one end of the potato pelvis, there's going to be a complete disassociation of the two sides of the potato pelvis. In younger patients, the bones tend to be stronger than the ligaments, so this tends to occur with disruption at the pubic symphysis. In older patients, the bones are weaker than the ligaments, so the anterior injury tends to occur with superior and inferior pubic rami fractures. In both cases, the posterior injury can occur either at the SI joints or through the ilium itself. These vertical shear injuries are the most unstable of the pelvic fractures, and they can also be associated with serious neurologic injury because the injury itself can actually shear off the nerve roots exiting the sacrum or the lower lumbar spine. The other thing is, and this is the most important thing, is that take pelvic fractures very seriously because they can bleed a lot. There's areas that you can bleed out if you have a fracture in, and the pelvis is one of them. So if you have somebody, if you have a trauma patient who's hypotensive, pay attention, look at the pelvis, and think of ways that you can stop the bleeding in the pelvis, whether that would be a roboa, whether it needs to be surgery, maybe it's angiography with with interventional radiology, all those are options to help stop some of the bleeding and really get your consultants in on this quickly so you can help your patients have the best outcome that they can have. So there is a lot more to learn about the management of pelvic fractures. So go get a book, do some more reading about it, go see a lot of patients, learn more about it, and have a fruitful day. Thank you.